He's notoriously media shy, but with a deal to privatise the Knights closer to being done, Nathan Tinkler is going on the front foot. The mining magnate today spoke about his original offer, which he describes as insane value. For that then to be challenged, I suppose, was a bit of a pill for me to swallow. Um, but fundamentally, I don't see that the offer's changed. I just see that uh, um, everyone sort of uh, let go of the emotional attachment, looked at it for what it is now, and uh, clarity's been provided around certain points, and uh, you know everybody can see it's a good deal. When negotiations broke down, he was highly critical of Knight's management. Today, he extended the olive branch to Chairman Rob Chu. I do this sort of stuff every day, so uh, um, it's a little bit different. You know, Rob's probably been out of his comfort zone doing it a little bit, so it's taken a bit longer. I might have been a little bit impatient with that, but uh, you know, we've both kept coming back to the table and we've both done what we said we were going to do, and that's what's, uh, that's what's put this offer on the table for members. As for his dealings with players, Mr Tinkler is desperate to bring Hunter products back to Newcastle, but says he's never approached Jamal Idris. He does admit to calling Cade Snowden shortly before he was due to re-sign with the Sharks. Look, I didn't make an offer. I just said, what's your hurry, you know? Um, you know, uh, the Knights are going through. We're going through a transition period. You know, what are you gaining by signing up now as opposed to June? So, you know, I didn't ring up and say, you know, I'll give you a million dollars tomorrow if you sign or anything silly like that. Uh, you know, I think uh, there was a few Sydney journos that are Cronulla fans that were had the knives out over that. With a vote on his takeover proposal likely to happen later this month, members and staff at the Knights are keen to finally meet the man. You know, I love to love to meet him face to face, and um, you know him to come talk to all the boys, and you know we know what he wants to do. He wants this club to be, you know, a, a strong club. Mitchell Hughes, NBN News. Another big CBD retailer bites the dust. I feel very sorry for the people who are employed by them. Um, you know, I think that's a, that's a real big problem, problem as well. Angus and Robertson is in the process of clearing out its Hunter Street Mall store hot on the heels of David Jones' exodus. The book chain's parent company, Red Group, which also owns Borders, has gone into voluntary administration. This store is one of 37 nationwide that will close. So obviously this store is not performing well enough. But I think it has, also has to do with the offering. Um, they've, they've gradually reduced the number of books and, and their stock. It means another vacant shop in the already largely abandoned strip following GPT withdrawing its proposed $650 million revamp. It's interesting that we seem to be at the mercy of the, of the large companies. You know, here's a large company, Angus and Robertson, the Red Group and Borders. Uh, GPT came in, bought all this property and then they closed Showcase Cinema. Meanwhile, it seems there could be some movement regarding the properties GPT owns in the area. This is all up in the air. They have received uh, offers, uh, uh, expressions of interest to purchase the properties. Madeleine McKell, NBN News.
An impressive sight on the ground, but even more so in the sky. And the view from up high speaks for itself. The fighter jets have been deployed as part of an air combat course. We take uh, our most capable fighter pilots and make them better. Uh, it's our equivalent of a Top Gun course. The Australians alongside their American counterparts from the Iowa wing of the Air National Guard. The big part of it for us is uh, packing up 90 tonnes of cargo and 150 people and moving them halfway around and under, under the world. The two-week program also exposed our pilots to different situations and strategies for a very real purpose. To serve, fundamentally, uh, Defence of Australia. These two aircraft here, the F-16 and the Hornet, are the main two aircraft used in the exercises. Both carry an array of artillery and are both very much built for speed. And this was definitely a case of mission accomplished. Words can't explain it. I will say that uh, by all measures, we have met and exceeded every goal we came here. Tyson Cottrell, NBN News. Oh, of course, you know, absolutely, you know, uh, I'm just a, uh, I'm still just a, you know, average Joe and, uh, you know, if you haven't got family, you haven't got anything, so, uh, you know, same as uh, today as they were then, they're still my number one asset. Yeah, and of course, married to Rebecca and four children yeah, uh, yeah. at a y youngish age. Yeah, no, that's right, um, you know, up the valley, uh, um, we didn't get uh, All Star in that back then, so I started early and, uh, you know, it's, um, it's been good. Obviously success uh, has its benefits, at, uh, but I should imagine there are times that it have, has its downsides too. So wealth and uh, expectations and not everything in life. No, no, ex exactly. And, uh, you know, people tend to draw a lot of conclusions and all this sort of stuff about, you know, what you're like based on what they read or hear or see or some like down the pub or whatever. And, uh, you know, um, I think the... I think the wealthier people are perceived or something like that, the, the taller the tails are, so to speak. But, you know, I'm still the guy that uh, a lot of guys in the valley worked with and know and played football against and all that sort of stuff. Does it get to a situation every now and then where everyone seems to be tapping you on the shoulder? Can you give us a hand with this? Oh, yeah, th there's a bit of that. There's a bit of that. Um, you know, you sort of... Uh, I do the things that, um, you know, I think, are, I think are worthy or that I've got the time for. But, uh, um, you know, it's... Uh, you know, something like this, it's important, I think, for members to sort of see me and, and understand that I am, uh, understand that I am, you know, uh, positive and doing this for sort of the greater community, not, uh, it's not a rich guy trying to force his way into own a football team. Yeah. You have been a benefactor of the Knights in the past. Uh, when did it occur to you that financially they were getting further in the mire and you needed to step in? Yeah, I guess, um, I, I guess towards uh, the end of last year it was becoming uh, sort of evident that I was going to have to tip in some cash again and that sort of thing and I thought, uh, you know, it's a bit of a spiral, um, you know, I think the Knights have survived for 23 years because of um, sort of, you know, there's been plenty of guys before myself that have helped out the club and uh, that sort of gets them to one point and then, uh, you know, they move on and then somebody else comes along and, uh, you know, that's... Unfortunately, the club's always limping, though, under that sort of scenario. But, uh, you know, whether it was, um, you know, uh, plenty of people, you know, West, West before me that were, were good to the club and helped them along. And um, you can only go on for so long like that. If you want to compete and sort of uh, collect, uh, collect premierships, I think you need to, to uh, be fully funded. How important is local to you? And could you see one day where... 80% of the side is locally born and bred. I think in 97, 8 of the 13 that ran on at one stage were locally born and bred. 2001, 13 of the 17 were locally born and bred. Is that where you want to get back to specifically with the Knights? Oh, look, I, well, I think that's just proof, isn't it, that it can happen, you know. Um, we can either sort of, uh, you know, uh, part of that is, you know, I've got no doubt we produce enough good footballers, it's being able to retain them and that means being able to pay them and stuff like that. You could, you could pick a Hunter Valley 13 right now out of the NRL, no problems at all that would win your competition. But uh, you've got to be able to retain them and you've got to have the balance sheet to be able to do that, you know, so... Joe Wheelhouse admits it took longer than he'd hoped, but today he was all smiles as he committed to be a Newcastle Jet for another two seasons. Yeah, definitely I wanted to stay here from the start. That was my um, preference and they knew that all along. Um, and yeah, like I said, I'm just happy to have another two years at the club and the, the way the club's going, uh, I think that's the only place I, I want to be. Wheelhouse is hoping they can add even more local players under Nathan Tinkler's ownership. Yeah, it's good to see. I don't think we've had that many over the last sort of four years we haven't had this many players so 
hopefully we can get a few of the young boys signed up as well over the next few years and um, yeah, it's only good for the, the region and the club. His teammates proved this season they respect and admire his aggression, unlike opposition players. So will he be changing his style anytime soon? Oh, I don't think so. I think um, that's the way I've been brought up and um, wear the heart on the sleeve and yeah, that's, that's the way I am. Mitchell Hughes, NBN News. I think it's a pretty smart move and it gives you a lot more options as far as what the treatment uh, is available to you and um, you know, it gives you a better chance of recovery if, uh, if it's diagnosed early. If we can raise a bit of awareness and um, you know, sort of stop that barrier for men um, you know, sort, of, sort of being a bit too tough to go to the doctor or that sort of thing, if they've got a problem, you know, I urge them to go, go do it and it could save their life. This is not a, a one act show, it's a, it's a variety of acts and a variety of entertainment. There's something there for everybody.
Not even the threat of rain kept crowds away from Lambton's Wine and Food Festival. Stall holders were run off their feet. Sold out a couple of times yeah, already. Yeah, yeah, we've sold um, two full paellas now. We're going for the next two, so it's been good. As foodies sampled the goods. Scrumptious. Supporting hunter businesses. It's going fantastic. Um, the, it's been quite overwhelming, actually. Wine country vignerons peddled their fares. A lot more people than last year, a uh, lot more interest in the wines. With great success. The idea behind the festival is a simple one. Honor has always thought of Sydney as one of their greatest uh, markets and Newcastle, it's on its back door and yet Novocastrians need to know more about a Honor Valley and a Honor Valley needs to understand more about Novocastrians and I, I thought that Lambton, being somewhere in a kind of a halfway house, would be a perfect location to do it. For the ladies at least, there were a few other attractions as well. What's the real highlight been? Oh, it's just relaxing, beautiful day in the park. and um, Drawing a semi-naked man? Yeah, that's it. <laughs> the festival continues tomorrow. Madeleine McKell, NBN News. From the reactions of some members at the night's information session, it's clear Nathan Tinkler still has a handful of people to convince about his proposal. Speaking exclusively to NBN, the mining magnate made it clear his money is guaranteed and all profits will go back to the club. We want our, uh, our Hunter communities, our, our national brands to be strong and, and something that we as a community are proud of and, uh, and you know, we only get that if the money goes back in and can, continues to develop. I'm obviously putting up a, a $20 million guarantee to make sure that, uh, you know, I'm, you know, that rolls every two years so that you know, my obligations are, you know, they're, they're hard in concrete, so to speak. As for the coach, it's been widely speculated that Rick Stone will be heavily scrutinised if Mr Tinkler takes over but it appears the two have already developed a strong rapport. The prospective owner wants the NRL to bring back reserve grade to help the coach learn more about his club. I think it's harder too for guys like Rick Stone to be able to, you know, he needs to be looking at those games too and, uh, and say, yeah, this kid had a good game. And he revealed it was Stone who fueled the interest in Cade Snowden. Rick had made that introduction and facilitated those discussions. So uh, and it wasn't, wasn't me saying, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy my favourite player. The mining magnate also wants to develop stronger ties and pathways with the real NRL and competitions on the North Coast and in the North West. Twenty-one years on, and the rubbish keeps piling up. There are a lot of people who just can't do the right thing. Clean Up Australia Day was certainly needed here. Belmont Wetlands, again, the region's worst dumping ground. Yeah, it's easy to come in here and drop a load without anyone seeing you, so I suppose they take the easy way out. It seems the paper delivery boy certainly took a shortcut. There'll be another two or three loads to... To go yet. Just no. of newspapers. Just of newspapers. But that sickening feeling was echoed throughout the region. Cigarette butts proved popular in Glendale. Smokers give up. The items a little more upmarket elsewhere. I have got a flat screen TV found near Warners Bay. In Newcastle, efforts to recover waste reached new depths. Harbourside dining was clearly on the menu of those less thoughtful of the environment. And as the day went on, the fun and games were lost on volunteers. 
Helping hands were down this year, making the load even greater. But there's always hope. Oh, it was good to teach them from an early age, you know, what, what's good and what's bad. She's, she's me rubbish spotter, so she'd say, Dad, pull up, there's rubbish. But we didn't get the drive very far. Nat Wallace, NBN News. I've called this the start of the industrialisation of the valley. Race 7 at Broadmeadow was only seconds old when the drama unfolded. Three horses finished without their riders. Alex Stokes, Jake Hull and Jeff Penzer left stranded. I was just looking for which, which horse to follow and you know, it just happened too quick. And then the next thing you know, we're lying on the track. Stokes and Hull were released from hospital this morning. Alex is battered and bruised but hoping to ride on Tuesday at Cessnock. Penza was today joined by his wife at the John Hunter after undergoing surgery to a deep cut on his left arm. He's confident he'll get to see his kids at home in Western Sydney tomorrow. No, this is nothing. This is nothing. There's only a few stitches and away you go. Jeff says he's been lucky to avoid serious race falls during his career, but he was thankful for the efforts of the NJC staff. The ground staff are terrific, the barrier boys and the stewards and uh, the starter are on the scene straight away, you know, Ambos and um, you, know, you looked after straight away. So what was the, you know, when you first hit the ground, I guess, what did you sort of feel, what was the injury that you knew? Yeah, it was 08, I had, a, had an amazing race here in the mud and um, you know, two two turns from the end, I you know bike broke, so I didn't didn't quite get that win. So I love Daytona; it's probably my favorite event on the circuit, actually. She wasn't exactly kissing babies, but premature Bub Lincoln proved an important stop-off on the Premier's campaign trail. She announced $10 million for a new paediatric intensive care unit at the John Hunter. Now what we'll be able to do with the construction of this new intensive care unit is to provide care for some 500 children a year through the provision of six intensive care beds. The Premier's proposed streamlined cabinet cutting 20 ministers to 13 super agencies has raised eyebrows in the region. However, she failed to rule out whether the Minister for the Hunter would be scrapped. On the rail line matter, she was refreshingly resolute. Rail currently services the CBD and certainly in my view, rail needs to continue to service the CBD. But the Premier was light on detail instead offering a new line she's waiting on Newcastle Council. I've always said there needs to be a rail based solution. I'm not going to stand here and tell you it should be light rail or heavy rail. That's a planning decision that has to be made in concert with the Newcastle City Council. Earlier, Ms Keneally opened the new drug court in Toronto. Announced tenders have been called for the $94 million Newcastle court complex and then headed to Honeysuckle, where she promised $10 million to help the university relocate its business and law schools. Jane Goldsmith, NBN News.
Aldi's significant investment in the region was announced by the State Planning Minister this morning. This uh, warehouse, uh, some uh, $100 million, it'll create 400 jobs, uh, 50 construction jobs and 300 permanent ongoing jobs as well as about 40 uh, ongoing um, casual jobs. It's good to see such a, a renowned establishment setting up here. It's a good endorsement for the Hunter and shows that uh, it's worthwhile investing here. The 57,000 square metre warehouse will be built at Beresfield and form part of the Freeway North Business Park. It will service 75 Aldi supermarkets in the north of the state with tenders to be called shortly. It's very strategic for Aldi but it's also great uh, for the Newcastle Hunter area as well. Also today, the Minister announced $2.55 million in the form of low interest loans to upgrade caravan parks at Jimmy's Beach, Hawks Nest and Seal Rocks. What we'll be doing in each of these caravan parks, increasing the number of uh, cabins and the facilities, sewerage, etc. Lauren Bladwell, NBN News. Four years after John Quinlan helped establish a committee to push for a public hospital in Lake Macquarie, locals are still travelling to Newcastle or Wyong for treatment. For too long this area has been the forgotten part of uh, the healthcare system in New South Wales. We have 23,000 people in a catchment area and we need a public health facility. The South Lake Integrated Healthcare Committee wants the hospital put back on the political agenda and has called a public meeting for March 17. On the invitation list, the electorate's five candidates for the state election. They've all agreed to come and they will commit themselves to this project in one way or another. They'll be given an opportunity to speak and then the other attendees at the meeting will have an opportunity to question them. The committee's model for the hospital is based on a similar facility at Lithgow and includes day surgery and palliative care units as well as home care and rehabilitation services. Lauren Bladwell, NBN News. I love Newcastle and I think this is just the right place to have a museum of tribal art. It means a lot for the uni. It means that we can become a resource centre and the first of its kind, a museum of the first of its kind in Australia. So it will really put Newcastle on the map, both nationally and internationally. Premier Keneally, welcome to Northern New South Wales. There's just 19 days until the state election. The polls aren't looking so good for Labor at the moment with, I think, a projected primary of 23%. You had your bus breakdown yesterday, a <laughs> fire alarm at a law court this morning. How do you find the motivation to, to keep fighting? <laughs> well, it's easy to fight for things you believe in when times are good. The more important thing is to fight for those things even when times are tough. And that's what I'm out there doing. 
I've been contacted by an, an ALP candidate mm. who says that they're in an ultra marginal seat, mind you. They said that they're not getting much support from the ALP to run their campaign. Are you? Is it a strategy just to hold on to the seats you already have rather than mm. targeting a coalition held, uh, independent held seats? Well, look, I know the journalists always want to talk about strategy in campaigns. Uh, I'm not doing that in this campaign. The election will be on the 26th of March. And I'm fighting every day between now and the close of polls on the 26th of March to do two things. One, to talk about what my positive plan is for New South Wales. Two, to hold Mr O'Farrell to account. But are you targeting those seats that, that the coalition holds? Well, or are you? Today, I mean, this bus is just going around at the moment in the Hunter, the Illawarra and Western Sydney at this point, mm. Labor Heartland. Is well, that where you're concentrating? Today I was in the seat of Lake Macquarie. We don't hold the seat of Lake Macquarie. A hop, skip and a jump from Newcastle though, where you, where you spent you the But you put night. to me the question, you put to me the question, are we only targeting those sorts of seats? I put to you back, today I spent time in Lake Macquarie. Yesterday I was in the most marginal seat in the state, that of Miranda, and I was in the seat of Cronulla, which we also don't hold. This is a campaign for families right across New South Wales. Well, the cornerstone, or one of the cornerstones of your campaign so far, Fairness for Families, is this rebate, this $250 rebate. Is that going to cover the costs of these electricity rises that, that, we, that we're projected to be seeing? Well, for next year, yes, it will. Next year, electricity prices in New South Wales are projected to rise by $130 to $220. Mind you, they're going to rise all across the country. New South Wales is not unique in facing higher electricity prices. And some jurisdictions, on a percentage basis, it's rising even higher than in New South Wales. But for New South Wales families, what matters is how do they meet that cost? Well, we've done two things. One, we've removed the cost of the solar bonus scheme. So we've absorbed that cost. That's $100 that families won't face next year. And we've also, with our $250 rebate, we're going to fully offset the cost and indeed for many people eat into their current bill. What role has your government, though, played in, in the rising prices of electricity? Well, there are many reasons that electricity prices are rising, uh, and that includes a range of things, such as the need to invest in the next generation of distribution and transmission infrastructure, uh, the rising demand for coal from China and overseas. Uh, electricity prices have also gone up due to increased usage of electricity, uh, which you can see per household has risen dramatically over the last 30 years. Well, you've arrived in the seat, in the Labour Hill seat of Newcastle today. One of the major issues here has been the Newcastle rail line and the future of it. The indecision has been blamed uh, for a la loss of major investment. What's your position now on the future of the rail line? Well, I'm very clear that rail needs to stay needs to stay in the Newcastle CBD. Uh, I came in and looked at this, first started looking at it as a planning minister. And yes, I can see the challenges of having the heavy rail line that where it currently is. Some people say it's a barrier to urban renewal. I say we're not ready to make that call yet. Rail, though, is incredibly important. It's Im what can Christina Keneally do that Barry O'Farrell can't? Oh, well, keep Hunter Water in public ownership, ensuring that water prices uh, are not driven up by privatisation, uh, not place a cap on the number of vulnerable children that the Department of Community Services will assist. That's a policy Mr O'Farrell announced this week. And certainly what we've seen through COAG health reform, where I went to Canberra, secured $6.6 .6 billion for our hospital system, Amazingly, Mr O'Farrell can't decide if that's a good thing or not. Have you only got 19 days left as New South Wales Premier? Well, there's an election on the 26th of March. That's up to the voters of New South Wales. Unlike Mr O'Farrell, I'm not going to walk around arrogantly. I'm certainly not going to stop giving information to people about what my plans and policies are. Remember this. Some 900 days ago, Mr O'Farrell promised the people of New South Wales the one guarantee, he said, is we know what his plans were for our electricity se sector. Now, to date, he still hasn't delivered it. Well, if the people of New South Wales can't get one commitment out of Mr O'Farrell, how can they have any confidence in anything he's saying? Premier, thank you for joining us. Thank you.
The Knights received an unexpected spray at training this morning, but it wasn't from coaching staff. In reality, Rick Stone has been extremely pleased with his squad's build-up and performances in the trials. Richie Fayoso and Chris Houston have received plenty of praise during the pre-season, but the coach won't finalise his forwards until tomorrow morning. It's up to a dozen forwards in contention, and um, you know we're probably likely to take, I suppose, ten of those, you know, into the game. So yeah, we'll have a look at how everyone is. Stone was staying equally tight-lipped about the halves. Jared Mullen is locked in, but who he'll play alongside remains a mystery. Kurt Gidley could shift from fullback, while Ben Rogers or Bo Henry may also get the chance to stake their claim. I would like to give whoever we give a go initially a chance to find their feet a little bit and put a bit of um, confidence and trust in the sort of the combination we're going to start with. So probably the most contentious one. Adam McDougall was a notable absentee from today's session as he prepares for his father's funeral. Wes Nagama will take his place in the centres for the clash with the Panthers if the Mad Dog rules himself out. Basically about to do whether he thinks he's, he's, he's going to be ready to play. Uh, if he's not, we'll respect that and um, hopefully move on for the, for the next week for him. Mitchell Hughes, NBN News. Back at Newcastle Court, the former Knights forward faced a media scrum, including a pack of photographers. Remaining silent, 25-year-old Danny Wicks headed inside, flanked by family and friends, to face a sentencing hearing. The court was told Wicks would adhere to his pleas of guilty to two counts of supplying methamphetamine and one count of supplying ecstasy. But in a twist, Mr Wicks's barrister Paul Rosser told Judge Lakatos that his client could be called to give evidence in an ex officio indictment, which means someone could be brought directly to court without committal. Mr Rosser said the DPP wants to call my client against his will for another proceeding. According to a spokesperson for the Director of Public Prosecutions, Mr Wicks's case has been adjourned while the DPP considers the evidence of his case and related cases.
Wix's matter was adjourned to May 3rd and there was no objection to his bail being continued. Jane Goldsmith, NBN News. There's advice available from the National Parks and Wildlife Service um, in relation to driving speeds um, and uh, preparing the vehicle uh, for driving on the beach. It was one of the worst wrecks Newcastle crash investigators had seen. The Holden Ute was barely recognisable. Two brothers in their 20s, Joe and Ben Ramsey, along with Rodney Field, were killed when the vehicle crashed on Freeman's Drive at Morissette on December 4 last year. 47-year-old Joe Anthony Fenwick was arrested last month. The lengthy charge sheet includes three counts of manslaughter, six counts of dangerous driving and four counts of negligent driving. Plus, driving with a mid-range blood alcohol reading of 0.096 and using an unregistered and uninsured vehicle. In court documents, police allege Joe Fenwick caused the death of Luke Joe Ramsey, Ben Matthew Ramsey and Rodney Craig Field in circumstances amounting to manslaughter slaughter whilst under the influence of alcohol. Police also say he drove an unregistered car at excessive speed with unrestrained passengers failing in his duty of care to those persons. Fenwick will reappear on May 4. Jane Goldsmith, NBN News. An impressive show of force with pinpoint accuracy. These airmen and soldiers are being put through their paces as part of a four-week course. Uh, a JTAC is a Joint Terminal Attack Controller. They're responsible for coordinating air with our surface forces. On the ground it was all systems go. So too in the sky as hornets flew overhead. They'll drop 500-pound uh, bombs, laser-guided training rounds, 20mm um, uh, ammunition. Preparing the ammunition, an art in itself, as is hitting the target. They need to uh, identify the en enemy, protect their own guys and also protect civilian infrastructure. The JTAC exercise is one of the final stages in these soldiers' training and what they learn here could very well be used in real life with some troops to be deployed to Afghanistan in a matter of months. They are actually uh, playing an important role uh, both in the current fight in Afghanistan and obviously as far as future ADF capability. Tyson Cottrell, NBN News.
From the outside, you wouldn't know there was a dance hall there, apart from the arrival of a steady stream of well-dressed couples. Down a laneway next to an engineering workshop, under the colourful sign and up the stairs, there's a warm welcome for everyone. With the $4 entry fee squared away, nothing stands in the way of a night of music, friends and, most of all, dancing. A hundred people have gathered tonight to celebrate 25 years of the Rainbow Room and the live band, the Good Timers, are in full swing. It was all started by engineer Bruce Jarvie and his wife Barbara above their Newcastle workshop. Bruce passed away five years ago but Barbara and her volunteers have kept the Rainbow Room alive. Well we know the old people haven't got many places to go to and we um, just want to keep it going. Dancers like the Pride of Erin, the Carousel and the Swing Waltz hark back to the golden age of dance when almost everyone knew the moves and regular balls and dancers provided the perfect setting for romance to blossom. At the Rainbow Room, nothing much has changed and when the band takes a break, the fun and fellowship continues. Every Saturday night is the same here. There's not a cranky, grumpy person in the place. Everyone greets everybody as they walk in the door. Even strangers can walk in that door and they'll be made feel that they've been coming here for 10 years. It's fair to say that most of these folk aren't spring chickens, but the Rainbow Room is keeping a spring in their step. Not a hard exercise, but it's a good exercise. Well, the doctor keeps telling us to keep doing it, so it must be working, must be all right. When we're all gone, there'll be no rainbow room. So we need the young ones to come and join us, learn to do our dancing, and help to keep the rainbow room going. He's got some expectations on himself, like most decent players have, I'd, I'd reckon. And, um, you know, he, he seems ready for it. You know, there's no need to shield him, I don't think. I had a, had a goal last year to play first grade and I didn't get there. So then I had a little setback and kind of put me put myself down a little bit. But once I come to the ninth, you know, there was a good opportunity here. If Nathan Tinkler's plan comes to fruition, Newcastle's two biggest sporting teams will soon have a stronger link. Former Knights forward Luke DeVico and Jets captain Michael Bridges have got the ball rolling, preparing to open a new tapas bar together on Derby Street. Um, pretty apprehensive, yeah. Um, very excited though. We've, we've put a lot of hard work into it and thankfully it's, it's all paid off and come together. Bridges is clearly sold on making Newcastle his permanent home. He's moved his whole life to the city, but don't expect this new business to signal the end of his football career. We've got such a long off-season and you've got to keep yourself busy as well as keeping fit. So and our first and foremost is football and then this is a, a nice side venture. As for Nathan Tinkler's influence, Bridges has nothing but praise for the mining magnate. The striker was one of several players on the long-term injury list who were today briefed on what's expected of them heading into a long off-season. It's good, it's great to see things happening off the field as well um, to make this club more professional and, and run as a, as a professional outfit, which it, it's lacked over the last two years. Bridges says he's also spoken to contacts in Europe about finding the Jets' new marquee striker. Mitchell Hughes, NBN News.
It's had a few lean years, but with a host of the world's top surfers on their way, it's clear the popularity of Surfest is on the rise. It's unbelievable and it's just great to see Newcastle people come together from uh, the Callaghan students right through to the surfers, to the local community and everyone, the media, everyone. It's a great celebration for the city. Paige Haggerston will be one of two locals in the Open Women's Contest. At today's event launch, she admitted she hasn't been doing enough surfing lately. She's more nervous about her fundraising efforts for cancer research. Paige will turn 20 on March 20 and will celebrate by shaving her head before the men's final. Decided to do it because I've always wanted to the past few years and my best friend's sister passed away at 16 just from cancer and my granddad passed away four and a half years ago from cancer. The former junior Australian champion is also taking part in the Miss Surface competition. Any prize money she wins will be donated to the world's greatest shave appeal. It was a great idea to get into as many events in Surfest and help out with surfing as much as I could and doing a bit of commentating also. I might get the word out about shaving my head too. Mitchell Hughes, NBN News. Seeing is believing, and these Curry residents turned out to witness signatures to save the local hospital. The reason that we had this launch here today was to make sure that the politicians declared that they were actually going to save Curry Hospital and invest in services. At face value, the signs were promising. It's just sad that we're here again um, fighting for the survival of Curry Curry Hospital. We need to draw a line under this issue and say it's here to stay. The Labor Party even announced some long-awaited funds. A re-elected Labor government, Keneally government, have committed $6.7 million investment into Curry Hospital. It's to build infrastructure, it's to uh, do construction. Curry Hospital is hardly a picture of health. It's clear little has been done to keep it in shape and many are asking questions. I'd like to know what you people know about this new hospital. We need another primary health care service in the area, but um, that's not a short-term plan, that's a long-term plan. An expensive and big plan that might result in some having to let go of their local facilities. Well, I'm, I'm 81, but there's other people coming on. It's a younger generation and everybody needs this hospital. And they can't afford to lose it. Nat Wallace, NBN News. A simple message issued loud and clear. No, we don't need new coal, we don't need gas, we need more investment in renewable energy. Today, State Planning Minister Tony Kelly heard from residents worried about future mining. There are health costs, environmental costs, water costs and the cost of climate change. Is it OK to offset costs to children who are too young to even understand these problems? I feel that the government has raped our valley of what was once <laughs> beautiful. It's I think the community have got to be consulted more. I think their interests have got to be taken more into account into the future. So we're currently surrounded by mines. They're above us, um, underneath us, right next to us, and we can't coexist any longer. Some even labelled the forum a waste of time. 
what we really need to be seeing is the policy, uh, not uh, a consultation session in the caretaker period of a dying government. Following the meeting, the Minister said he would go back and speak to Premier Christina Keneally tonight to outline specific areas in the Hunter which are to be excluded from mining. And that's what many of these residents wanted to hear. Well, that's certainly what we've been requested to do, uh, but I'll have that discussion with Cabinet and with the Premier. Tyson Cottrell, NBN News. It's an intriguing story and one Richard Belfield today shared with university researchers. His grandfather, Algernon Henry Belfield, was a farmer in Armidale, but also a keen astronomer and meteorologist well ahead of his time. He collected detailed climate data from 1877 to 1907, unknowingly providing a useful and unique resource to modern researchers. Well, it's not only rainfall, he's gone into barometric stuff, wind direction, speeds, cloud formation, they're very concise. The Bureau of Meteorology didn't start collecting official data in the New England until 1961, making Algernon's remarks and figures vital to those trying to predict future weather events and patterns. Temperature, humidity, these are number one elements. I look at maximum temperature, minimum temperature of average of the region, then I look at the extremes taking place in extreme events. His 30 books of data are archived at the University of New England, but the actual figures are also being donated to the University of Newcastle. And he had quite a few ties with Newcastle. Like we, we just said, well, let's share it amongst the two unis. Jane Goldsmith, NBN News. It's an intriguing story and one Richard Belfield today shared with university researchers. His grandfather, Algernon Henry Belfield, was a farmer in Armidale, but also a keen astronomer and meteorologist well ahead of his time. He collected detailed climate data from 1877 to 1907, unknowingly providing a useful and unique resource to modern researchers. Well, it's not only rainfall, he's gone into barometric stuff, wind direction, speeds, cloud formation, they're very concise. The Bureau of Meteorology didn't start collecting official data in the New England until 1961, making Algernon's remarks and figures vital to those trying to predict future weather events and patterns. Temperature, humidity, these are number one elements. I look at maximum temperature, minimum temperature of average of the region, then I look at the extremes taking place in extreme events. His 30 books of data are archived at the University of New England, but the actual figures are also being donated to the University of Newcastle. Both surfers cruised into the final on the Gold Coast, Kelly Slater, all class as always, while defending champion Taj Burrow did away with Geordie Smith. In the final, Slater wasted no time in stamping his dominance in the choppy conditions. Burrow did everything he could to try and keep up. But he struggled. And he wasn't alone. But Burrow had plenty of competition, not just in the surf. The West Australian gave it one final shot. But it was Slater who, 13 years after the pair first met on the tour, emerged with a record third event title. Mobbed by fans, King Kelly made his way to the podium in fitting fashion, but when asked whether he'll stay on for the rest of the tour, meaning we'll just have to wait and see. Tyson Cottrell, NBN News. We were fortunate in those days, we had a lot of junior kids, good junior kids coming through in a really solid first team. 
but that's not the case these days. I think Nathan will take this club to a different level and uh, I've listened to what he's got to say and there's nothing sinister about it. it it's unbelievable what he's prepared to do. Slight onshore winds and a small swell, not ideal conditions for the Indigenous pro, but competitors still made the most of the right and left handers off Merriweather Point. In the Open Women's Final, three-time winner Jenea Hanari of Shortland, a professional lifeguard, proved she's at home in the surf. But Foster's Lara Haddon, a Waramai girl, was best on the day, dominating the waves and going on to victory. During the men's final, Mother Nature managed something more contestable. Junior champion 17-year-old Bo Wills of Saratoga surfed in back-to-back -back finals. But Russell Maloney, already a six-time champion of the event, went on to make it seven. The 33-year-old father from North Entrance and the Darug tribe will return to Surffest later this week. I surf in the QS event on Wednesday, so hope, fingers crossed that I can do well in that event as well. While he experienced WQS events in Europe last year, he says the Indigenous Pro remains one of his favourites. We got, had guys come all the way from Victoria, Coffs Harbour, Foster, and, and um, they all surf really good, so I'm just glad they come away with a win. Today he took home $500 and plenty of glory. Jane Goldsmith, NBN News. It's time to dust off the boots. The cowboys and cowgirls are heading to town. We've got the Reg Lindsay Rodeo on Saturday at Cessnock Showgrounds. It's 17 years since the rodeo was named after the country music legend. Reg Lindsay passed away in 2008, but the stockmen still stand by his widow. This weekend's event will be the third Ross has handled without her late husband. It's pretty tough, but I'll keep it going, keep his name up there, and that's the whole idea of it. Tough times certainly hit home last year. Animal Liberation filmed the Stroud and Cessnock rodeos in a bid to have them banned. We do everything we can to make sure that the stock are well looked after and presented and uh, I don't anticipate any problems. In fact, organisers are hoping to get record numbers through the gates. This year's herd of bucking broncos includes some of the country's best. And it seems this mare, Cathy, is keen to keep her record intact. The last four years she hasn't been ridden. Yeah, yes, yes, so she's a good mare. Nat Wallace, NBN News.